And with that, it is my great honor and my pleasure, and I am so excited to introduce to you today a good friend of mine, as well as a professional in the field for a very long time, Jody Strom, who is here to share with us art therapy for people in a hurry. Now, isn't that an appropriate topic for a Monday morning? I just love starting off the week with this session. I'm so excited to hear what she has to share with us. A little bit about Jody as well is she is a certified art therapist and registered clinical counselor. She is currently a service provider for British Columbia's First Nation Health Authority. And she also does work in private practice and on contract with women in recovery from violence. Jody has worked in addiction treatment and recovery as a counselor, art therapist, Indigenous program liaison. Art therapy was a natural confluence of Jody's experience and training as an art educator, artist, and administrator, and her work in the addiction field, including her own recovery from codependency and trauma. As such, she brings both a professional and personal lens to her practice in support of others seeking recovery or to improve their well-being. Jody's therapeutic approach is rooted in positive psychology and is strength-based, trauma-informed, inclusive, and collaborative in nature. Jody creates the safety, support, and opportunity for her clients to release fear and anxiety so they can freely explore themselves through art materials. The art materials act as a container for our emotion and our stories and convey what may be difficult or perhaps impossible to express in words. Individuals can then start to make sense and meaning of these stories and begin their healing journey. So with that, Jody, Jody I would love to pass the couch, the floor over to you um, to share your brilliance and your wonderful art artistic expression with our community today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much. And thank you to She Recovers and the team that creates this amazing opportunity for all of those who identify with um, women's community. Uh, my pronouns are she here, she here, <laughs> she her. And um, I live on the unceded territory of the Coetzin people. Um, the introduction was so concise. I, I don't know if there's much more to add, except that I'm going to make a generous assumption about all of you that um, you know how to look after yourself today. So I'm going to be offering some activities. And um, if any of it feels too activating or it feels too much, just, just stop and listen. That's all you have to do. And, um, and that'll be enough. And approach it in a timing that fits for you. So. Um, the theme today is anxiety. Um, I'm sure none of us are feeling that this week, this Monday. Um, and I'd like to start, before I start talking at you, um, I'd like to invite you into a little grounding exercise. So hand on your heart if you can, taking your right hand onto your heart, if that feels comfortable to do so, gently closing your eyes or lowering your gaze. Take a moment to check in with all of your body sensations. Notice what's happening. And let's take three deep breaths in through the nose and out through the mouth. Letting go of all of the stuff that's happened already this morning and bringing your awareness to this space, this moment. <sighs> knowing that even though we're on a social media webinar that we are connecting. And I invite you to imagine that we are sitting in a beautiful circle together. I invite a feeling of safety. Again, trusting that you know how to look after yourself in this. Okay, so I'm going to um, open up into a um, PowerPoint point in a few moments. Um, and I have an outline for that, uh, but in the spirit of creativity, I may just depart that text completely. Um, I was hoping to do a whiteboard exercise, but for some reason in the webinar that doesn't show up. So I'm going to kind of riff off of that. Um, okay. So I'm going to try and do a share screen. So art therapy for people in a hurry with apologies to Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, I, I kind of borrowed that title. He, he has a, he's done amazing work and he has a book, uh, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. 
Um, and the subtext is loving ourselves through anxious times. Um, <clears throat> and that's, uh, that's an important theme, the loving ourselves through anxious times. Uh, part, of the, part of what I'm going to do is I'm gonna talk about what anxiety is and how we can support ourselves through it um, using art therapy. So the outline of this uh, webinar, um, which we'll probably do this for about a half an hour, it might be a little bit more than that, and then we'll have a half an hour of, um, of questions. So we'll start with an intro and acknowledgements and safety, which we've already done. Uh, so set up and doodle invitation, I'll cover that in a moment. We'll do the PowerPoint. Um, and now I can't see what this slide says, but personal practice and an activity. We're gonna create our own emojis and we're gonna do some transformative overwriting. And then I'm gonna invite you into some no pressure play and creativity for self-support. And then we'll have our questions. <clears throat> so coming back to the setup and doodle invitation, as you got your invitation, I hope that you were um, invited to bring some paper and some pens whatever paper fits for you, whatever pens fit for you. Um, color would be fabulous if you've got it. If you don't, it's totally fine. Um, you can use printer paper. Maybe you've got a journal you like working with. Maybe you wanna get some watercolor paper. So trust your instinct and find um, whatever uh, materials fit for you. And my invitation is throughout this uh, presentation, please doodle. I invite you to doodle as crazy as you like. Um, just have fun with it. Be playful. Uh, in addition, uh, so have a few pieces of paper. Um, as we get into our PowerPoint, I'm going to invite you to make a parking lot for yourself. So if you've ever been to um, a seminar, they often put a parking lot up where they ask for people's concerns and questions and throughout the um, presentation, they address those issues. So what that does is it kind of lets our brain, um, uh, it, it lets our brain let go of those things that we're worrying about. We're putting it in a spot, it's literally a parking spot, but we're gonna do it a little differently. We're gonna make a cloud. It's gonna be like a thought bubble cloud. And I'm gonna invite you to put all of your anxieties and worries down there. And you'll have that, um, handy as you go and as more worries come up just keep putting them in there and um and then we'll address that at the end as well okay here's the next slide here is your thought bubble so invitation to doodle throughout and create an anxiety cloud and here's some that i came up with that have been in my mind maybe you can relate to some of those as you know um, if I kept going, I would definitely fill that bubble and probably more. <clears throat> so parking all of these worries, putting them down on a piece of paper. So what happens as we do this is we are exteriorizing these concerns that exist in our mind and our mind can create the sensations in the body. And as we put them on paper, they literally leave our body through our hand and they're on the paper. So they're there on the paper. Don't worry, you're not gonna lose them. They're on the paper. You can go back to them whenever you need, but that will help. This is a tool to help ease our anxiety. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, anxiety and how it has existed in me today and this week. Uh, no matter what our spiritual um, practice, a lot of us are experiencing anxiety at this time of year. There are many um, celebrations and holidays and gatherings and there's work events, um, solstices tomorrow. There are so many things going on. And even if you don't uh, acknowledge or celebrate any of those things, just trying to go out and get anything done, there's more traffic, there's more stress. So no matter what's going on in your world, we're going to likely have an increased level of anxiety. <clears throat> so this, um, what I'm sharing with you today is in an effort to help with that as you go through the week. And I, I put family in here in the middle because it's one of our biggest challenges um, as we go through recovery and I'm in recovery from codependence and trauma. 
as well. And um, as we are in our recovery and we do our work and we transform our way of being in the world, it does tend to stir up the family system. And especially at a time like this, it can be really fraught with anxiety and tension. And um, I don't know about you, but in my family of origin, I, I don't last too long before I can start to lose myself. I really have to you know, have ninja self-care and ninja awareness in order to get through that. So I put that in the center for a reason. And um, it's, and also that idea of loving ourselves through anxiety. Um, be gentle on yourselves. This is hard work, especially dealing with our family of origin. It's really hard work. Okay, next slide. What is art therapy and how can it support my recovery? Has anyone ever painted on themselves like that? It's so fun. I highly recommend it. It may be activating as well. So always know yourself and know what your tolerance level is. But um, I've had an opportunity to, to get involved in an activity like this and support some clients through this. And it can be a lot of fun. Okay, so here is what is art therapy. Um, there's a definition from the American Art Therapy Association. And uh, I, I put that one up there because it's pretty succinct. And I think there was a lot of Americans joining us today. Um, I'm in Canada. I don't know if I said that, but I'm in Canada. Um, in the States and in Europe, um, the profession of art therapy is quite a bit more advanced than it is in Canada, more recognized and supported. So there's the... Um, there is a good official description. Art therapy is an integrative mental health and human services profession that enriches the lives of individuals, families, and communities through active art making, creative process, applied psychological theory, and human experience within a psychotherapeutic relationship. So that's all well and good. I like Carl Jung's quote here, often the hands will solve the mystery that the intellect has struggled with in vain. So in brief, in art therapy, you don't need to know how to be an artist. You don't need to have any art experience whatsoever. You don't need to know the difference between a brush and a pencil. Um, the art therapist is there to support you with all of that. And it's never about performance. Um, um, and we don't judge your work. <laughs> We're not gonna critique your work. It's much more about what's happening for you as you engage in, in the process and the process itself provides um, the artwork creates a third voice, a third hand as we're working. It's like, a, it's like your own personal helper that communicates between your psyche and subconscious with the art therapist. And together we make meaning of that at your own pace, always in your own sacred pace. So as we know in our recovery, I don't know about you, but I have a tendency to flip-flop between the past and the future, past and future, past and future. I have a past experience and, and then in the present, I might get a trigger. And next thing you know, I'm in the future um, catastrophizing. That's one of my favorite things to do is catastrophizing. So we know through our recovery, whatever you're recovering from, that we want to come back to the present be where our feet are. We always want to come back to the present. That brings us calm. And when we're calm, we can make better choices. We can make healthier choices in the, in the simplest sense. So art therapy does all of these things that are listed here. It's multi-sensory. It involves all of our five senses. <clears throat> as soon as we get into our senses, whether we're smelling crayons or we're hearing the scratch of a pencil on the paper, um, or we have our hands in clay, or we, we gently stroke a dry brush on our, on our skin before we dip it into the paint. Any of those things, we're involving all of our senses. So that's going to calm our nervous system. So it's body-centered. Whatever we're doing in art, we are using parts of our body. Sometimes we get up, sometimes we're moving our whole body to um, create imagery. Again, brings us into the present. Uh, emotional and creative expression. When we can either speak or we can um, exteriorize our feelings, and have our voice through creative expression, again, we're going to be coming into the moment and it's going to calm our nervous system. 
through exteriorization, which is the next point, and absorption. Many people have the feeling when they're um, engaged in an art therapy practice that um, they call it the flow state. Uh, where they lose track of time, they lose track of, or they get so absorbed in the activity that they're not aware of the things going on around them. I always say it's like um, you're taking your brain to the spa when that happens. You're giving yourself such an incredible uh, relaxation response in the body. It's very healing and nourishing for our whole body system. Meaning making is the next point. Uh, often, we don't really understand what's going on for us. We can't make sense of our emotions or our reactions um, or our imagery. But over time and with the support of a trained art therapist, you do make that meaning for yourself. Uh, metaphors will show up, patterns will show up. Uh, it also reduces the stress chemicals. And um, I did some research on this uh, just recently. And there are more and more studies coming out. Art making itself reduces cortisol in the body. And now they're also saying that <clears throat> art therapy, which is art making with a therapist, adds another whole um, positive layer on reducing stress chemicals and increasing the relaxation chemicals in the body. Also, um, it enhances mindfulness, which we know supports our recovery. When we are more mindful, we make more healthy um, choices for ourselves. It just feels better, doesn't it? Okay, what is anxiety? Anxiety is the body's natural response to stress. It is a fear or apprehension about something that's happening in the future. And that's key. So this is something that's happening. Um, our mind is very involved in this as well as all the chemicals that come from a stress response, um, a trigger of some sort. And we're gonna talk about these triggers in a bit. The triggers are very important to notice and, um, and how we do that in art therapy. There's many ways that we do that. Uh, so, the other important thing is that this is a natural response to stress. Anxiety is a natural response to stress. There is, of course, um, the extreme end where anxiety becomes um, a problem in your life. So just like anything um, like addiction, if it starts to interfere in your life and it goes on long term, it's tipping over into another category. That's not the category that I'm talking about here, although the things that I'm going to share with you can help that category of anxiety as well. And the fact that it's um, our mind is going to the future, again, coming back to the present, anything that we can do that can bring, it, bring us into the body and into the present can be helpful. Here are the common uh, anxiety symptoms, increased heart rate, rapid shallow breathing, restlessness, difficulty concentrating, sweating, nausea, dizziness or lightheadedness, muscle tension, difficulty sleeping. So these again, we're talking about the short term and it's, it's connected to a trigger of some sort. And it's usually a reasonable trigger. You're having a, a stress reaction to something that's happened. Um, so that's that idea of short term with purpose. So stress and anxiety are meant to support us to move through the stress that could be um, life threatening. So question for you, just take a moment to consider this, where in your body do you experience anxiety? Now, if you're someone early in recovery and you feel quite dissociated from your body, don't worry, it's okay. If you don't know or you're not aware of the sensations, that's okay. So again, inviting you to just be so compassionate with yourself. This will come in time. If you don't like the idea of touching your body, like when I invited you to put your hand on your heart, that's okay too. Honor, honor wherever you're at. So taking a moment to just consider where in your body do you experience anxiety? I usually experience it in my chest. My chest feels a little bit fluttery and my heart beats rapidly. And what triggers your anxiety? <clears throat> 
So for me, I have many triggers for anxiety and I named a few of them and you saw them in that bubble. Um, and the more that we can be aware of our triggers, the more that we can look after ourselves to make the decisions we want to make that align with our values and our goals in our life. Okay, now here's a crazy idea. What are the anxiety benefits? Well, anxiety is adaptive and protective. It's, it's um, you know, old, old uh, reaction in our body that's meant to get us through a stressful situation that could be life-threatening. Now in our everyday world, um, we have these reactions to things that aren't life-threatening, but our body doesn't know that. Um, it's communication. Our body is giving us information. And again, when we're tracking and understanding ourselves and how we react, this is data. This is information to help us understand ourselves better. It can be motivating. Um, so I'm doing this today and it's a little out of my comfort zone. Actually, it's a lot out of my comfort zone. And uh, technology is something that I feel very challenged by. So I felt anxiety about um, preparing for this presentation, but it motivated me to learn something new. It motivated me to push myself to do something rather than um, whatever else I might be doing at this time. So it's energizing. Uh, we get those stress chemicals, which can um, give us more energy. And here's the other thing. Sometimes when we get worried, and we're concerned and we feel anxious. Actually, what we're feeling is excitement, but we've been trained to, to bring that negative connotation to it. So I want to invite that idea that actually, when you feel anxious, you might actually be excited. You, the, the excitement might be level with the anxious feelings. Okay, loving ourselves through anxiety. Here are some things that we can do to support ourselves through anxiety. And the word through is very important as well. It is not gonna be helpful to pretend we're not having it. Um, to go into denial or spiritually bypass ourselves is not gonna be helpful. So the first thing we can do is identify, okay, my chest is fluttering, <clears throat> I have anxiety. As Soon as we do that, we've identified and accepted it. We're reassuring our body that we're noticing. And as soon as we do that, the body's immediately going to start to regulate. <clears throat> and then we reassure ourselves, this is short-term. Anxiety is short-term, it's going to pass. And then moving to that place of, how can I support myself in this minute? How can I set boundaries? How can I change uh, my plan in order to support this? Maybe I need some help. Maybe I need to ask for help. Maybe I need a new tool. Maybe I need to learn something new. So whatever it is, um, moving through that, identify, accept, and reassure. Coming into our five senses. Um, some of you know the five senses exercise. Your hand is always here, so don't worry. You don't have to remember it. Counting down five things you can see, four things you can touch, three things that... Um, what is it you can smell um, and that you can hear, two things you can hear and one thing that you could taste. Sometimes for the taste, it's just uh, whatever residual taste you have in your mouth. These days it's, you know, you might smell your mask because we're all wearing masks. Um, taking deep breaths. Anytime that you increase um, the length of your exhale longer than your inhale, you're going to initiate that parasympathetic nervous system response in the body that helps calm your nervous system. Mindfulness, focus on what you're doing in the moment rather than all the things that are going on in your mind. Um, any grounding exercise. So I always have a basket of stones. Um, anytime I'm working, I literally carry my basket of stones around with me <laughs> um, when I'm doing groups that aren't in my studio. So I'm holding on to a stone right now. Isn't it, isn't it fabulous? It's really cool. And when I am anxious, if I hold on to this stone, it helps to ground me. What's happening is that I'm exteriorizing that tension into the stone. I can squeeze it as hard as I need to. But if we think of a stone, it's earth. Stones are so old. So if you think of the journey that this stone has, 
had to get to my hand, it's pretty incredible. And as soon as I start to think about these things, calms my nervous system. I'm in the moment. <clears throat> Awareness, self-research. That's the next point. Okay, this is part of what we're going to explore today. What I mean by that is noticing ourselves, noticing what makes us tick, noticing what our triggers are, and um, documenting it, tracking it. But of course, I'm talking about doing it in a visual way. Ninja self-care and self-regulation. We've touched on that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> you're going to know what works best for you, no matter what you're struggling with. Things like um, looking after your diet, your exercise, um, engaging uh, with other people, um, all of those things are going to support uh, your well-being. Okay, and no pressure playing create. I'm going to touch on that at the end. That's pretty fun stuff. Okay, next slide. Oh, no, one more. One more question. Um, what have you tried that helps soothe your anxiety? So we all have different things that we do. I'd like to, you to bring your awareness to what have you done for yourself that helps soothe your anxiety? Some people sing in the car. Um, some people dance. Dancing is a great way to soothe their anxiety. Take a moment to think about what soothes your anxiety. What things have you tried that work for you? And maybe jot them down. I have that image up there for a really important reason. Um, art making is something we've always done. There's a scientist in the States, Dr. Ellen DeSanayaki, um, and her specialty is um, the ethology of art making. And if you look at this, ancient um, cave painting. We actually don't even know yet what this is about or why those handprints are there. There's lots of theories. Uh, and I mention that because a lot of this, a lot of our self-research and a lot of art therapy, there is mystery involved. And I'd like to invite you into that mystery. Mystery has, it, it's gray area, it's the unknown, and we can often be afraid of that. Um, but I'd like to invite you to explore this idea of mystery um, as much as you are able to. Art making is inherent in who we are as humans. We have always done this. It's this idea of making something special or making meaning of it. And it's how we sort out and make sense of our world, the world around us, metaphor, story, all of these ideas. So it's a natural way for us to make sense of our lives today. Um, and we can use whatever materials make sense for us. Some people do earth art. Some people go out into the woods or wherever you live, that whatever landscape you have, the desert, and use the natural forms to create meaning, to make, to connect with yourself. The other reason I love this image is because it looks like a lot of people put their hands there together. It doesn't look like there's one person there alone. And we are so much better together, especially as those who identify as women. We are so much better when we're holding each other up than, than when we're tearing each other down. And because I love encouragement, you got this. Whatever your journey is, you got this. Take it one step at a time, reach out, and you can do it. All right, I'm going to I'm gonna stop sharing now, I think. Okay, so first of all, this is really weird. I can't see any of you, um, but I know you're there and I know there's people I know that are there. Um, so I know I'm connecting even though I can't see you. <laughs> so um, what do I want to share? Okay, I'm going to go back to the point of the personal research. And I want to share a story. And, and my invitation is that you be a detective of yourself. And some of you are already doing this. Uh, but the idea of being a detective of yourself, being your own personal researcher. And an example I'd like to share is um, uh, I have two boys, and they're going to hate me sharing this story. <laughs> Um, but my youngest one, when he was in grade two, 
I kept getting these calls from the teacher saying he's sick and he needs to go home. So I'd go pick him up. And this was going on for a while. And I started to think that this was becoming more frequent. And I got curious about it. And I started tracking it on our calendar. What, when, and how often I wanted to get a sense of what was going on, you know, thinking that maybe I'll tell the doctor someday. What I noticed is what turns out is that it was a particular day of the week. It was a Wednesday, every Wednesday, he'd call and he'd be sick and he'd come home and he was genuinely sick. He was nauseous and, um, and he needed to come home. And I, when I realized it was a Wednesday, I asked him if he understood what was going on and he didn't understand at the time anyway. And so I went and I had a meeting with the teacher and I said, what happens on Wednesdays? And she said, well, I'm not here. It's another teacher. So there was a, there was a job share and there was a different teacher there on Wednesdays. And and what it turns out, we met with her and what it turns out, there was a particular activity that she did every Wednesday that made him anxious and it made him sick. He got so anxious that he became physically ill. And we had a talk, we met with my son and they found a way to work through that so he could feel comfortable and he never called, he never, it never happened again. So this is an example of what I want to share with you. Now, if we suffer from OCD or any sort of obsessive um, behavior, I want to caution you about this because I don't want you to get too obsessive <laughs> or to tip over into that place. But I invite you to notice yourself. Um, start documenting how you feel, where, especially start with the highs and lows. Work it backwards. See if you can figure out what the triggers are for these highs and lows. And you may notice patterns. And the more that you notice patterns, um, you can better support yourself. So another example is um, I worked with a client who dreaded the month of November, didn't know why, didn't understand why, but we worked it back and they, she had a number of traumas that happened at that in that month, a number of things that were really devastating in her life. And once we talked it through, once she was able to identify that, it helped her anxiety um, and it transformed her relationship to that calendar month because she understood where it was coming from and she could look after that. So that's the other word that's really important to use in art therapy is transformation. Through the art making, we transform our experience. So we might start out in an activity with um, anger toward someone. And as we go through the activity, the activity itself helps to transform that experience. And I can't tell you how many times this has happened where someone comes in with a really difficult um, emotion and the miraculous transformation that can happen at the end where they did not expect it. But as long as you open up to that experience, um, you can transform these feelings. And it's never about, um, saying that whatever's happened is okay. It's not that it's kind of like, it's kind of like forgiveness. Forgiveness isn't about saying what someone's done is okay. It's about looking after your own, your own experience of it. Okay. Now let me see where I am. Um, so a number of ways that you could do this personal research uh, is uh, the, there's many, many different apps out there that can help you to track your mood um, and offer all sorts of quick helps. Um, I have another client who suffers from really intense anxiety and he has an app and when he's in those moments, they, they have like a quickie um, extreme anxiety intervention app. And I think it's 10 minutes long, but it can really help to soothe his nervous system and just get him to the next moment. So those things are available. I highly recommend them. Um, also, uh, in the last time I did this type of presentation, we talked about the scribbling, the blind scribble, journaling, visual journaling, any sort of journaling can also help. Uh, and here's the thing I was going to do on the whiteboard. Um, we don't have the whiteboard. So um, is it really 1140? 
Am I nearly? Yes, but you keep going with your genius because you're answering ah! some of the questions that have come through. Okay. So please know that that's happening as well. Yes. Okay. I'm so sorry. So here's the other thing. Um, so what I was going to do is we were going to do some personal emojis on, on the whiteboard. The whiteboard's a great little feature on Zoom. Um, literally a whiteboard that you would be able to see me drawing them. So my invitation for making your own personal emoji is just make a bunch of circles, all different shapes of circles and experiment with different faces. Even if you don't know how to draw, you can do this, put little dots, make straight lines, uh, vertical lines for the mouth, crooked ones, and just play around with it and see what you get and let those represent your, your emotions. You can also do it for the weather. Some people get triggered by weather. So it's important to notice these things um, and how they affect how you, how you work through your, um, your daily life. I don't know if you're gonna be able to see this. I'm gonna put this up. This is um, someone else's that I worked with and he gave me permission to share this. He made this uh, emoji ch chart and I use this with clients all the time so that if you can't say what you're feeling, you can actually point to one of these. This one here I find particularly powerful. I don't know if you can see it. It's just a black, smoky, empty circle. And I know that many of us can relate to what that feels like. You don't need any words to describe it. You just point at it. Um, okay, next um, activity that I wanted to share with you is called transformative overwriting. And my invitation is first on your paper, you would create a beautiful border. So making a square around the outside of the page and color it in and maybe you've got some bling and some sparkles, um, eco-responsible sparkles, of course, um, and uh, gold and silver and metallic gel pens, whatever you wanna do, make this really fancy border around it. And whenever we make a border, we're creating safety for ourselves. We're creating safety for our emotional selves. It sounds silly, but it really works. So if you're, if you're concerned about your, your emotional safety, just draw an outside edge around whatever image you're making. And then here's the idea of transformative overwriting. Say I'm having a really difficult time in a particular relationship and I'm really mad and frustrated at someone and they're just not behaving the way I want them to. What I can do is inside that border, I start writing them a letter ex saying exactly what I feel. All the words, don't edit, uh, don't worry about spelling and punctuation, just write it all out, stream of consciousness, swear if you need to, write it all out. Now you're gonna get, you're gonna start at the top of the page and go to the bottom of the page. When you get to the bottom of that page, you go back to the top and you keep going, right, right over those letters that you wrote over, that you already wrote. So you're, you're, you're writing over top of your previous sentence and you come all the way down to the bottom of that page. And then you go back to the top, same page. So you're gonna write over your letter three times. And I'm going to show you what that might look like. Typically, what happens about when you're when you get to about a page and a half, you're about in the middle of the second time writing over top, you might stop and you might think I got nothing else to say. So then you write, I got nothing else to say. I don't know what to write. I feel stuck. Why am I doing this? This is silly. And you just keep writing those words. And before you know it, you'll be started again. And that's the moment where you transform. That's the moment where it changes into something else. So I'm just going to hold up an image of what it looked, what it might look like. So I don't know if you can, I'm not sure if you can see that. This is some transformative overwriting where someone has written over their writing three times. And I'll show you another one. Now, I just got to say, is that not beautiful? It's beautiful. It's not writing anymore. You cannot recognize a single word. We've all tried. You cannot see the writing. So you have transformed your writing into a visual image. It's now 
not a language that you recognize and chances are you have changed your emotion that you started the letter with into something else and that last one I showed you the woman who did that she was having a very difficult relationship with her daughter who was suffering active addiction and she took all that pain and anger and by the time she finished her letter she felt love and forgiveness so that's what's possible if you want to try that I invite that um oh I think I have to stop I don't want to stop <laughs> Um, the idea of creative play, I'll say one more sentence about this. The idea of bringing creative play uh, is to, as you go through this holiday season and coming into January, which can be really difficult, see if you can bring an idea of creativity into everything you do. If you're stirring some soup on the stove, see if you can make a pattern in it. Um, you hear music and you're in a mall, dance chances are you're going to make someone else dance too. And you'll have this little joyful moment. It might just be a moment, but anything you can do, um, even footprints, footprints in the snow, just anything to play and bring creativity to your everyday life. What that does is it lets your body know you're paying attention to it and that you matter. You're telling yourself that you matter and you're cultivating joy. Okay. Thank you for listening. I'll stop talking now. <laughs> That's so beautiful, Jody. I, I mean, I, I share the same sentiment. I wish that we could just carry on because I know that we're just scratching the surface and I know it can be a bit of a challenge too, to kind of talk about doing art therapy, which mm -hmm. is not, you know, the typical thing. So thank you for being able to transpose that medium to the spoken word as well. Um, and I was, I was here um, behind the scenes doing my emoji and I'll, I'll just in full transparency, um, I'll share what I did so everyone can have the whiteboard experience. Um, and like we talked about, this is a, a judgment free space. So we're not, you know, going to judge my artistic skills. And I say that for myself, yes. I'm not going to judge. And what was really interesting that, you know, that came through that may have came through for many people is the invitation to do kind of more than one was like, wow, I can really have all of these experiences kind of happening at the same time. And for whatever reason, the one in the middle for me kind of carries more, um, I'm drawn to it, even though it's kind of hidden by the other ones, right? I can't see her whole face. Um, but yeah, what a wonderful experience to know that there's kind of all of these aspects of self kind of happening, you know, simultaneously at any given time. We had some tech issues, so I've got some sweats happening there. Um, and my, this is my frustrated face, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then I have my extreme joy, you know, just from being sharing space here and hearing your wisdom and being in community with like hearted people. And then kind of this is the excitement right about the unknown, like I don't know what we're going to do I don't know what we're going to be invited to do. And so how cool it is that all of you know these three things can show up at exactly the same time kind of instantaneously and I love that you invite us to take a moment to explore a little bit deeper so. Thank you for that. And th this is the, you know, our, our makeshift whiteboard experience happening here before your eyes. And, and you did, it was so beautiful because you managed to answer a lot of the questions that were coming through about this work um, in, in, the, in the final portion of your, of your session. And one of the other questions that I had come through early on was, what are some other tools to do kind of quickly in that moment when someone is feeling, you know, if somebody is feeling dysregulated, you shared a few of the ones that you can do at home, but is there anything in the, you mentioned dancing in a mall, um, right? The, these more kind of impulsive things. Do you have any more tools that you could share with people of what they can do in that moment to kind of interrupt the, the anxiety or text? Mm -hmm. um, it kind of depends on where you are, right? You might be in public, you might be at home, you might be, um, at work or in a car and so it kind of depends on where you are but it's anything you can do to get your get yourself back into reality um uh, a really good one uh we, that's part of psychological first aid is to either have a cold or a hot drink so if you have a cold drink your body's going to immediately feel that temperature and you're going to be activating your senses so that's one thing, um, anything like that. Um, 
uh, go, you know, if you can go outside, get some fresh air. Again, you're activating your senses. Really look, name things, name the colors that you're seeing, touch the textures. You can do that anywhere. Um, the idea of grabbing a stone and squeezing, you might not have a stone. I always have a stone. I prescribe stones. Put a stone in your pocket and carry it everywhere. <laughs> it really helps. But you can use a pen. And this is a public speaking trick. Use a pen and squeeze it. And, and you're just releasing a little bit of anxiety into an object that's that's not you. So those are a few quickies. That's so that's so beautiful because like what I'm hearing too, and I'm not, I mean, I'm not a scientist, so I could be wrong. Please correct me if I if I am. This isn't, you know, my realm of work. But what I'm hearing is that these are activating kind of that more of the intuitive right brain side of things and, and taking me out of the, the thinking and the doing and putting me into the more creative aspect of being in the moment. Would that be kind of accurate as to why it works? Or can you speak to that? Um, I think I think what I was talking about is more of um, grounding the nervous system. And then it, you, you kind of have to do that in order before you can get into the creativity aspect, but it's the pathway, the pathway in. And then you and then you can get creative by making the designs and or the creativity itself can help doing that by being sensory motor sensory motor activity. Beautiful. Thank you for yeah. explaining that. Mm -hmm. Oh, and scent, having scent, like if, if you're not allergic, anything where you can have a scent, like I, I have a scented lotion and when I smell it, it takes me to Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. What a wonderful, I mean, that's a much cheaper, cheaper and safer way <laughs> at this time to travel to Hawaii. Of course. <laughs> Um, another question is under the realm of this, this concept of no, no pressure play and create, mm -hmm. do you have any advice for recovering perfectionists? So I would imagine perhaps this person is, you know, yes, yeah, struggles to get going because we're so trained that art has to be kind of like a piece of art. So if you could speak to that as well. Yes, thank you. That's so, so important. Um, and that's where the no pressure aspect came in. Um, it's about not adding anything more to your plate. This isn't where you, you kind of say, you make an appointment to have a creative date with yourself, although that's a lovely idea, um, but it, you just incorporate it into your everyday life. And maybe it's even how you, so another way is how you put your makeup on in the morning, if you wear makeup um, or how you put lotion on. Like I put my makeup on as though I'm a, a warrior. I pretend I'm a warrior and I make these stripes like that. And so I'm immediately starting a creative play and I'm giving myself a message that, oh yeah, you got this. You are a warrior. You are awesome. And I'm giving myself all these messages right before I start the day. And it was no extra time. I didn't have to do anything extra. I'm just incorporating this idea into my everyday life. What a beautiful example. Thank you. I'm definitely going to try that. Oh, yeah, you do it. Oh, my gosh. I can't <laughs> wait. <laughs> um, somebody else has asked, can I ask what happens when the person actually sends you the stream of consciousness letter instead of keeping it? Um, mm -hmm. And you know that it perhaps is a reflection of them, but not you. So I am interpreting that that perhaps some, somebody has received a stream of consciousness letter from someone else and what to do with that information. So in a therapeutic setting, I would work with that individually. And when we do this exercise, um, we typically recommend you don't send it because it's not about the other person. This is a process for you. Um, so I would be really careful about that, that piece. If somebody feels it's really important to send it, um, what was the question? What about... What is, yeah, I'm, I'm interpreting it as um, what should someone do if they're, re they're a recipient of a stream of consciousness oh. letter? They can't read it, but perhaps they know it's about them. Oh, I see. Mm. Well, coming back into your senses, how does, how, how does that work for you? How are you receiving it? Um, and if it's disturbing, you might want to engage in the same exercise, again, just for yourself. This isn't about the other person. We know we can't change other people. So if you receive something like that and it's upsetting, maybe you do one for yourself about those feelings and that situation and that, um, that person and, and see if you can look after yourself in that and maybe transform it. And the other thing with that transformative overwriting, what we often do is we'll make it like a postcard and on the other side, you make an image that goes with. So you're doing the visual as well as the transformative overwriting. 
that gives it that other layer where you're accessing that subconscious part of yourself or your inner voice. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, somebody else would love to know what brought you to where you are today as an art therapist. Perhaps you could touch on that. I know it's been quite a quite a long journey, but it's a long story. <laughs> you know, long story short, um, I came to art therapy um, because it helped me. It helped me find recovery. It was my path through. Part of um, my trauma was to have a, a it was around um, my journal being read and I wasn't able to do any of these exercises for myself. And I got introduced to some of these activities by a wonderful woman. And, um, and it just, that was my path through for my own recovery. I still do it. Um, also, I was working with teens doing art making, and I realized there was a whole emotional component going on that I didn't understand, and I didn't know how to look after it. So I wanted to learn more. So this is a parallel journey to my own recovery. So beautiful and resonant for many people in this field. I, I just love that you weave your personal experience with the professional journey and ambition that you have to help other people. It's such a shining example, right, of what our own, you know, personal recovery pathways and patchworks can do for ourselves and then ultimately impact others. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, somebody else has asked, I'm often dissociated. What kind of art, art might help with this? <sighs> That's such a good question. And um, it all helps. Ultimately, it all helps. And my invitation would be to try a number of different things, but in a very supported um, therapeutic setting where you like, I don't want to tell you to find something that feels safe because you might not feel safe for years or maybe for the rest of your life, but trying to find a way where you can feel as safe as possible so that you can start to explore some of these. And this is gonna just take time. If you dissociate, it's going to take time and giving yourself a repeated experience of safety where, where your nervous system's getting regulated. I don't know what's gonna work for any one person. So you just kind of have to try it out. Would that be something as well that perhaps, um you know, for the first few times, would you suggest somebody work with an art therapist like yourself as well to have a, a, a guide there to help them? Yeah, and the and the reason for that is um, if there is any past traumas, this this process can be really powerful. And um, if there's any past traumas, the um, at art making can be activating. So with the help of someone else there who's trained to look after that, they can help um, the containment and, and make sure that you're, um, that you're okay in the experience. We don't want to re-traumatize you. And sometimes imagery can do that. Beautiful, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, somebody has asked if you could quickly share the idea of forgiveness and the, transform the transformative writing process. Mm -hmm. Again, if you could touch on that. Yeah, so um, this specific example was, um, uh, this woman was a mother of um, an adult child who suffered addiction and was not doing well with it. And so um, she had a lot of feelings about that. And they were largely negative feelings. And as she went through this process and she did, oh, I don't have permission to share image. I, I can't share the image. But um, as she made the image and did the writing, and this surprised her. She didn't intend to come to forgiveness, but at the end of that letter, that's how she felt. Um, and again, not saying that anything that had happened wasn't hard and really awful for her, but she transformed in her own heart, her relationship with her daughter. It doesn't change the situation. Her daughter didn't get better. None of that happened, but she can carry herself differently. So the act of exteriorizing and honoring all her feelings, acknowledging her feelings by writing actually the words and everything. She wasn't holding back. She let it all out. Nobody knows, nobody can tell what she wrote. It's completely confidential. That's the other thing that confidentiality piece provides the safety as well. So the mechanism inside her, she went through the exercise and it, it transformed. 
I'm looking over here. I don't know why I'm looking over there. It's such a testament to the power of something that could be seen as so, so simple or so, you know, so far away from talk therapy, right? To be able to use these other avenues to explore and maybe find a sense of safety within the self to come to something, you know, a surprising kind of ending Mm. to that experience as well. Um, our second to last question is about writing or drawing prompts. So is this a tool that you d- to give people a place to start? Like if they're feeling overwhelmed and they're not sure what to do, do you work with prompts? And can you say a little bit about that? Oh yeah, absolutely. And there's lots of prompts online. And um, I don't know if I can name one of the app. Anyway, there's lots of prompts online, writing prompts, visual prompts, um, uh, all of those things will help. Uh, anything that's going to kickstart you to look at things in a different way. One of the things that we do in art therapies, we're often turning things upside down and inside out. Literally, we'll take your drawing and I'll turn it upside down or I'll turn it around. And, and you might have a little aha moment as you do that. So anything that can shift your perspective, um, just a caution, that's not technically art therapy. It might be art as therapy or an art activity as therapy. You're kind of doing it for yourself. All of that's amazingly or can be amazingly helpful. If it starts to be difficult or you're not, um, you're feeling overly activated or fearful of it, you might want to get some help with it. Perfect. Thank you so much. And the final question is, can you share with folks um, how to get in touch with you? Should they want to work with you one on one? Um, And will this presentation be made available? And I'll kind of answer the second part first to say that if you would like to share the presentation with our community, I'm happy to put it on the She Recovers website. So please know that. Um, Okay, so first thing is I'm in Canada, and I can't legally do this work with anyone outside of the country. So I can't do art therapy with um, anybody in the States, Um, but I'm happy to make connection though. And I've done that with some people in the past from the last one and it's, it's lovely. You know, we can do little back and forthy things, but I can't technically do the art therapy. Um, So I don't know, but I think my website was on the invitation jodystrom.com. That's got my contact information. That's probably the best way to reach me. And um, yeah, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear any, any feedback and I, I'll ha- be happy to answer any questions that we weren't able to answer in here. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Jody. It's just the past the top of the hour and we so appreciate your time and for your heart and your experience um, to share your wisdom. I know that you're very, that you're very busy um, and we're doing the work, you know, individually one-on-one and in your community. So we're so grateful to have you join us for this series. I just want to also thank everybody who makes this series possible. And most importantly, thank you to the people who show up and, and listen and participate hold space and bring forward your questions because this series really is about is about you and it is stewarded by you. Um, we're actually going to be taking a break for Mental Health Monday. So this is, like I mentioned, the last one for 2021. We'll be joining you on this, the third week of January, or sorry, the second week of January with Andrea Owen. So we're really looking forward to that session. So please do um, sign up for the She Recovers newsletter. If you'd like to be informed about all of our upcoming Mental Health Monday sessions, and of course, for more information about the She Recovers Foundation and all of the recovery focused programs, resources and touch points we offer, please do visit SheRecovers.org to be in touch. So thank you again. I hope you all have a beautiful day, morning, afternoon, evening, regardless of where you're joining in from today. Take care.